Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Janice uh, Lesson McCarthy. Um, this is me. You. Hi. Right. Um, I'm Josh. Your name? Okay, Josh. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I will be teaching the bulk of the workshop, um, the R workshop. Josh is going to give what we call his reproducibility rant today. So you'll have that um, as, as uh, part of your your experience here. Um, I just want to do a brief outline of the workshop. So basically, our goal here is going to be to get you to be able to do the very basics of getting a data set into R, manipulating it into the ways that you need, so filtering out, you know, like lines of, you know, lines from a data frame, rows from a data frame, selecting columns from a data frame, um, summarizing, um, getting, you know, uh, basic information out of a data frame, that kind of thing. Um, and like, whole, like, what we would call exploratory data analysis. And, you know, making, and then we're going to learn how to make some really nice pretty plots with GD plot. Um, and then, um, so we're going to start here with the reproducibility R markdown in Git. Um, you'll work on getting up, hopefully, you can all access your GCC containers. Right? Are you on the, you are not? Yeah, I'm not right? Oh, cool. All right. Are you a JIG person? Yeah. Did you uh, get a net ID? Yeah. You did. Okay, so we'll figure that out. This, this always happens. <laughs> I always, so there's always, there's always. Okay, has everyone else been able to get into their GCC on demand? Good. Okay. Um, and I guess, see, I don't. He's something not to worry about it, but I also don't know if people need help on Zoom. But if you're on Zoom, I have no way of seeing any chat or anything right now, and hopefully we'll figure that out at some point. Um, there's like a call on here. Okay. In any case, if you're if you're on Zoom and uh, I, there might even be a TA, there probably is a TA on the chat, and if so, um, hopefully they will introduce themselves and you can chat with them. Um, if not, I'll figure something out at the break. Um, okay. So um, so yeah. So today we're going to do the reproducibility. You'll see what our our markdown notebook is. Um, and then we'll do an introduction to the DCC R Studio, and then Basic R. And that that it's a little it's like a little thing, Basic R, but it's actually quite a long notebook um, because I start out with things like what's a variable, how do you assign something to a variable, what what types of variables do you have, and we go very slowly through that until um, we get to um, yeah until we get to data frames, and and that and then. From data frames, we're going to move on to how to manipulate data frames. Um, oh, actually, I forgot too. There's going to be an R demo um, before we get to basic R. So basically, and I want to make this clear for the R demo, I don't want you to try to read the code. <laughs> I'm going to show you code, but I just want you to have an idea of what, what, what kinds of things you're going to be doing with R, what kinds of plots you might be able to generate, and, and ways, that ways you might summarize data, things like that. So um, you can follow along if you want to, but I'm asking that you don't get hung up on it. It's really just like the demo is really just see what R can do. Okay, cool. And then we'll get into base bar and we'll go very, very slowly and methodically. Um, I need to get a little bit of a, um, a poll here. How many people have some programming experience? Hey, all right. How many people have some experience with R? Some people, everybody, everybody? Wow, well, that's fantastic. So maybe I don't have to go so methodically slowly through all of that stuff, like how to assign a variable. There, there are people that do you know. But we don't see them, I know. Sure. Like I need to know, is there a TA on Zoom? You're on, are you on Zoom? Oh, good, okay. Are you getting any feedback from the people? No. I don't like that. Hmm. There's no, so if you're on Zoom, um, if you could just, um, can, you, can you see their hand? Oh, I might not be. You want to do the for my So yeah, um, if you're on Zoom, um, if you could uh, either put in the chat or raise a hand or something, what do you want to do? Ching, DA, TA, sorry. Do you want to have them raise their hands? Can you see them? Uh, 
hybrid. And I know I know you. Yes. Tell me your name again. Mahmoud. Mahmoud. Yes. It is really nice to see you, Mahmoud. Yes. Okay. Mahmoud was our was an intern in our internship program. Yes. Okay. There are some people raising hands. So the question was, do you have programming experience with R? All right. So I'll tell you what. So I might. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now I can actually see things on the screen from Zoom. Very nice. Okay. Plus two other hands raised. Plus two other hands raised. Very nice. Okay, good. Um, and how many people do we have on Zoom? Can I see that? I don't see that. I'm starting to think maybe we really should do, do this one or the other. Um, okay, so it looks like a lot of people have programming. Why don't I ask the opposite question? Who has no programming experience whatsoever? So take your hands down if you had them up before on Zoom. Who has no programming experience at all? Is there anyone who has no, has no experience with R? Huh. Okay, good. So what I'll probably do then is in my R introduction, I'm going to probably breeze through a whole lot of the beginning of my slides. Um, and then if I do that and people get confused and I go and I've done too much, then you should just stop me um, and say, hey, Janice, the, the, I, I, need, I need help. Okay. Um, and um, Ching, our DA, our, our, I don't know why I keep saying DA, our TA. Uh, <laughs> Um, is on Zoom and also available in the room, but um, mostly I think, Ching, if you could ma monitor the, ch the chat for us, that would be helpful um, because I, it's, it's, gonna, it's really hard for me to deal with people in the room and on chat. I'm, not, I'm just not good at it. Um, I'm trying to get better. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so that's, so that's today. So again, I'm going to reiter reiterate who, for people who are not here or maybe didn't get onto Zoom on time. In the very beginning, I'm gonna do an R demo. I'm gonna ask you not to try to read the code, unless you know how to read the code and you're fine with it, that's fine. But I, what I want you to take away from that is what you can do with R and the kinds of things we're gonna be doing so that, um, yeah, I just don't want you to get bogged down in how did you write it, because we're going to learn that. Um, okay, and then Day two, we'll probably still be doing some basic R, but then we have, um, yeah, the microphone has to go with me. Okay, um, we'll get into dplyr, uh, which is a package for manipulating data frames, and so we'll, we'll learn all the verbs of like filter, select, group by, summarize, mutate, and so on. Um, and then on day three, we'll do ggplot, ggplot with and real and with some sim simulated data, because I think that on day five, when you do experimental design, um, Richard is going to want you to know how to generate random numbers from different distributions. So we'll work on that. Um, and so that was day, so day three, ggplot. Uh, day four, we'll review using an HIV example. So we'll go back and do all the things we did with dplyr and with ggplot using um, a specific example from HIV. And then on day five, like I said, experimental design and hypothesis testing taught by an actual statistician. I am not a statistician, even though I'm in the biostatistics department, I am not a statistician. Um, Josh also, also claims to not be a statistician, statistician either. Um, <laughs> and then on um, day six, we will um, do a capstone project or, and this is important, bring your own data. So if you have something, a data set that you've been wanting to analyze, and you would like to learn more about how to do that. Um, if you want to bring it in, um, I will, um, I, I'm, I'm the adventurous one here. <laughs> I will go, I, I will help you with it. So you can bring it in and you just ask me questions about what you need to do. It's basically good free consulting. But um, yeah, but uh, you should tell me the week before that what, what you're bringing in and maybe even send it to me. I won't look at it, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you could send it to me so I just have some idea um, of what's coming at me and, and also an idea of how many people are going to be bringing their own data. Um, and then, and Josh, and the other option, if you don't bring your own data, is Josh just going to do a costume project with you, which is, again, going to be very much the same as like going through an example, like just exploratory data analysis of an HIV um, data set. Okay. Yeah, I hate using these microphones. <laughs> all right. I think that's all I wanted to say for now. And Josh is going to start his reproducibility rant, and then I'll be back with an R demo after him. Uh, you, you just go as long as you want. <laughs> okay. I didn't hear whether you said uh, just that we refer to as my reproducibility rant or we lovingly refer to it as my reproducibility rant. Okay. So I'm going to try and do the hell mic because. I can't handle the um, the little uh, the upper mic for too long. I didn't break it, Matthew. Definitely didn't break it. Let's do. We're gonna have the other one. This is not to call him out for you know being a couple minutes late, but this is Daniel, who's our other TA. So if you're uh, um, well, if you're on Zoom, you probably can't see him yet. But um, so we have two TAs in the room. So it, today, at least for my part, I hope you know you're mostly just going to be listening to me. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should. Uh, Maybe I'll show DCC. I don't know if I should show DCC. Nah, we'll wait. Oh, great. I'm getting like things popping up. Oh, where's my cursor? It's laggy. Come on. Now, wait, can I do. Let's see. Yeah, I'll 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 deal with it. Wait, can people hear me? Can people on Zoom hear me? Yeah. Oh, cool. I can hear people on Zoom. Oh, too loud. Uh, um. Okay. So as Janice said, this is what's lovingly referred to as my reproducibility rant. Um. I'm going to. Uh, do this. Uh, this is a little laggy and it's kind of annoying. Oh, wait, now I need to do probably better if I do it like this. You're getting to see the magic. Uh oh. Oh, I didn't start it again. Sorry. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm just going to move this over onto this screen so I can, no, oh, that screen. I guess I can take this as an opportunity to demonstrate. So if people want to, ah, oh, crap. I think I stressed my um Oh wait, is it too? Yeah, I'm a big fan of this too. Hey Matthew, can can I like have is it possible that one of these screen? Oh no, no, it's okay. Maybe. Um, okay. So if you you do not need to. Oh, perfect. Thank you. You read my mind. Um, okay. 
So if you want to, what's the best way to find this? If you want to, if you want to go ahead and log on to onto the computing resources, you don't actually. You, you can kind of follow along with. A, I'm going I'm to do a little bit of like computational stuff in like 10, 15 minutes um, that you can like totally just watch. But if you do want to follow along, which again, not super necessary, but you can. Um, you can go to um, Duke Compute Cluster. So the easiest way, I think, to get there um, to use this, um, this short link, which maybe is too small for you to see, um, HTTPS. Can people here see that bigger? How's that? <laughs> okay, yeah. If you can't if you can't see it, you are blinder than Janice. Okay. So go here. Any is it okay if I scroll now? Okay. So then if you scroll up a little bit, there's a link here, DCC on demand URL. So if you click on that, I'm opening a new tab, you should get well, it's gonna ask you for your net ID and password. Um, I'm already, I've already put mine in, so I'm all set for that. Um, and then you can go here. Sometimes if the window's like really big, it'll say something different. Oh yeah, there, it'll say my interactive session, but um, most of the time it just has like this little thingy here. You click on that, then it should look almost exactly like mine. And if I'm, if I go too fast, please tell me to stop. Um, and then here, um, you want to click on at the very top, CHSI R Studio Workshop. Um, and if you tried this over the weekend, you had to change things, but now it, that's all fixed. Um, so you shouldn't need to change anything. And just scroll to the bottom and click on Launch. And now, like, there are like 15 of us trying to do it at once, so it might take a little minute for the system to be happy. So you can see here it says queued. Um, I can point here. Oh, no, it already happened. Oh, no, it's not. So it said queued at first. Now it says starting. Um, what we're waiting for is, yeah, this, where it has a blue button here, connect to our studio server. And then at the top, it's going to say running. And so I'm going to click on connect to our studio server. And when that's ready, we should see our studio. Um, so it might look a little different for you because I'm already in a project, um, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Yep. I don't think the login is again other than our studio. Oh, that's well, that's super weird. Are you guys from Duke? You are from Duke. You guys have that. Um, I've seen a pattern before. It's like it's asking for the login, and you're but but you went through DCC on demand. Um, can you maybe both um, um, both copy the URL in the title bar? And compose an email to, I think it's research RC. I can't remember. Maybe they changed it. Hold on. I have it. I email them all the time. Um, so it's res computing. Oops, nope. Um, here, I'll put it here. <laughs> is this. Um, Res computing at Duke Daddy to you bigger? Yeah. Is that be bigger? Okay. Yeah. Um, and just say like it's you're logged into Duke Compute into the DCC. You can say DCC O O D, um, DCC open on demand, and it's our studio is asking you to put in a password, a username, and password. Okay. 
So maybe try that. Yeah, so if you go back here and you go, I mean, I, I feel like I've, yeah, so if you go to delete, um, and I will say that you don't need to do this right now, but you know, if you want to, I know that I like to follow along, so. Okay, so ignore what I'm doing. I'll explain in a minute. Or not in a minute, it's gonna be like 30 minutes. <laughs> It is. I'm being honest. Okay. Uh, let's make that full size. What's the thing? Oh, I know what I was going to. Okay. So I'm going to talk about reproducible analysis. Um, and as Janice you know, said, and I will agree, this is like a rant that I like to give um, because, as you'll find out, I feel quite strongly about reproducible, re, reproducible analysis. Um, and that's where I need to see. I got all logged in. Um, this don't do. Um, you can do it later if you really want to. I don't know. That's ah. Can't push the right button. Oh, and I forgot to open the window. Okay. I'm going to explain what this is in a minute. No, again, not a minute, like 30 minutes. I couldn't decide whether I. Okay. Ah, I don't know what I just did there. That was super weird. And apparently they're doing construction next door. Okay, that's good. We're gonna just let that run and we'll come back to it, like I said, in like half an hour. Okay, so overview. Um, yeah, can I, do I have this open? Uh, let's skip this. Well, no, now I can't decide. Uh, let's do a quick poll. Okay, oh, and there's a QR code and everything. How nice, uh, did I start it? Yeah, exactly, okay. so. Um, just to give me a feel for like what people know about reproducible research or don't know, um, you can go to this link or there's this QR code here. You can do it on your computer or on your phone or whatever. Um, and I'm trying to remember how to actually tell when I've gotten responses. Thanks, Shane. Um, it's where it tells me. Do I have to switch over? Um, yeah, so basically, you know, I want to know if people have heard about reproducible research, if they have experience with reproducible research, and I think it's helpful for everyone else to know. Um, oh, there, I'm getting responses. How many people are there here? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and we have some um, 14 people. So, well, okay, I'm gonna give you like 20 more seconds because I have 12 responses and there definitely should be more than that. Although Matthew's logged in at least twice, so, and I'm here. Mm -hmm. 14. That's Matthew, by the way, who's like our, who came in here and like keeps, it's just the one question. The one question. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take 16. Last chance. Oh, okay, really last chance. Okay, let's see what people said there. Uh, oh, wow. So, like, I don't know, Janice, maybe we should just call it a day. Because, uh, like, everyone knows R and everyone uh, tries. Yeah, I mean, I don't say E. And I'm teaching this, I think. Okay, uh, so like, I'm not sure they need to know. yeah, maybe, I don't know, it's true, okay. Uh, no, okay, fine, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people are saying they try to re work reproducibly, but they're not perfect. You know, a few of you are saying, I, I, don't, I know what it is, but I don't really do it. And some small number of you are saying, you've heard of it, but you don't really know what it is. 
uh, nobody's doing it 100%, which is good because, like, like Jana said, if you really, if, if if you think you're perfect, then I don't know. Because uh, I know I'm not. I mean, I guess it took me a while to recognize that I'm not. Okay. So what's reproducible analysis? Oh, the slide's being weird. Okay. Well, um, so when I put together this talk, I spent a while trying to figure out, um, trying to find a nice definition. I couldn't, so I finally gave up and came up with my own. And so my definition is that reproducible analysis is it's an important part of reproducible research. It's not all of reproducible research, it's the analysis part. Um, and that it requires that all the components of the analysis are archived so that anyone can independently re repeat the analysis and arrive at exactly the same result. Um, and so a key part of this is, um, is that anyone. Uh, so who do I mean by that anyone? Well, you know, if, if you've worked in a lab before or if you've like done research before, you've probably had the experience that you know, you do something, um, or maybe like one of your colleagues, peers, lab mates um, does something, and you know, months later, your lab mate or you realize like, oh yeah, I need to do like something like that, and so like someone comes to you and says like, hey, can I, can you tell me how you did X because I need to do that for my project and I've never done it before, mm -hmm. right? Um, has anyone ever had that experience? I'm the only one. A few other people. Okay, good. Yeah, so that happens all the time, I think. Um, certainly has happened to me before, like both ways. Um, me asking someone else, how do you do X? And someone else asking me how to do X. Um, so, uh, come on. Why is this not working? There. Um, so that anyone who might want to um, repeat the analysis can also be collaborators. You know, you, uh, well, for me, I work with collaborators all the time, and um, you know, part of what I'm doing is like doing the analysis for them, and then like maybe they want to learn how to do it. Um, of course, it, uh, you know, in science, there are collaborators and competitors, and you know, sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different, right? But like the science, right? So if you have a competitor who's who, you know, you've published something, you have a competitor who, is, who might be working on the same area and they might also want to replicate your work. Um, there can be like people in completely different fields, you know, let's say I work on duckbill platypuses and I do some sort of analysis on data that I generated from duckbill platypuses and then like someone else who works on, you know, plant genetics or something says like, oh, well, like, I don't work on decadal platypuses, but I want to apply that method to the plants that I work on, right? So it can be completely different areas of research where people want to um, use your, um, your analysis, re reuse your analysis, apply the analysis that you did to their own project. And the most important person from my perspective um, is, is me in six months, because um, you know, all of these things have happened to me, including like six months from now, I'm like, ah, I have this data set and I just need to do this analysis um, just like I did six months ago, different data set. So like I'm gonna have to tweak things a little bit, but like it took me a month or two to get that analysis working. I don't wanna start from zero. I wanna start from like, you know, what, what, what I accomplished over that month of like working on the analysis. Or, you know, has also happened to me, work on a project, gets published, three or four years later, collaborator comes back to me and says like, oh, you know, there's a new student in the lab who wants to like build on that project. And we just need to like, can you like do this additional little analysis on top of what you already did? And so that we can kind of like have preliminary data for that project. And so it, when I have done things reproducibly, I can say like, oh yeah, sure, let me dig up that code and like repeat the analysis and repeating the analysis is super easy if I've done it reproducibly. And then, you know, it's just like that little extra bit as opposed to starting from scratch. Um, so, you know, 
what I'm going to try and convince you is that reproducible analysis, I'm going to admit to you in a second that it's not zero cost, but the benefits far away the cost. And um, you are one of the people who's going to reap, reap the benefits of, of doing things reproducibly. Okay, so uh, as I sort of alluded to, reproducible analysis is part of re re reproducible research, but it's not the whole thing. So there's a whole other area about, you know, reproducible experimentation in a wet lab or in the field or whatever, where you're actually like collecting the data. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so there's lots of stuff I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to go into like too many details because um, you're already going to have to listen to me rant about this for an hour or so, and um, you probably will be happy to have me done ranting. Um, and I'm going to tell you, give you sort of like an outline of an approach that's what works for me. It doesn't mean it's the only way to do things. At the very end, I'll give you some links to some, you know, recommendations that other people have that are somewhat different. Um, so, you know, this isn't the only way to do it. It's a way that works for me. Um, and you can, you know, if you want to do things reproducibly, you can adopt some of what I do and you can, you know, adopt some other approaches too. Um, and I just want to be clear that uh, I'm going to dump a lot of stuff on you of like different different components of reproducible research. Um, what I don't want you to leave here today and leave from the workshop um, with, I don't want you to leave here thinking, oh my gosh, that's a lot of stuff. I just don't know where to start. I'm like, reproducible research is great, but I just can't handle this. Um, anything you do that's you know, more reproducible than what you're doing now is an improvement and it's gonna, I think, reap benefits. And like I said, I'm not perfect. I don't always 100% do things reproducibly. I'm certainly a lot better than I was 10 years ago. Um, and, I, you know, I've added components incrementally and I think that there's really, you're gonna, even if you don't do everything that I'm gonna talk about here, if you do some things, you're gonna, you six months from now is going to appreciate it. And science will appreciate it, and your colleagues will appreciate it. Um, so I encourage you to try, even if you, you, know, you don't go from where you are now to 100%. Um, and I also want to admit that, um, like I said, there, there is a cost to doing things reproducibly. In general, it's, you know, there's a little bit more effort that goes into it than, you know, just doing things non-reproducibly, just doing it, you know, like kind of um, quick and dirty, not that you can't do things quick and dirty and reproducibly, because um, you can. So, you know, it's kind of like eating your vegetables. Um, I like vegetables. I eat vegetables all the time, but, you know, like, I like junk food too, like bag of chips and some cookies. Sounds good. But, you know, I, I like to think I'm an adult. I mean, sometimes. Um, and I know that like, if I had a bag of chips and cookies for lunch today, like by now I'd be feeling really gross. And so, you know, I try and eat nutritious and reproducible research is kind of like eating nutritious, right? It's, it, maybe it's like a little bit less fun. I mean, you know, like delicious, you can have delicious nutritious foods. I'm saying it's not, but like junk food is engineered, like literally engineered for you to be addicted to it. That's a whole different conversation, but, um, and, you know, it, it can be really satisfying to like, oh, I'm just going to do this really quick. I don't want to go to the trouble of, of uh, you know, setting up a, a Git repo to, to capture this code. I'm just going to do something really quick. Take me five minutes. I can tell you every time I've done that, I've later regretted it, and I've ultimately, like, had to go back and do things reproducibly. Um, so I, I think that the investment's always worth it. But I do, I want to be clear that it's not like there's no cost, um, but I do think it pays off. Okay. So with all of that, like, introduction, um, you know, what do I mean by reproducible research or reproducible analysis? So my approach to reproducible analysis, I like to think of it as having three major components. Um, the, 
the components are how you, and it's like basically how you handle these parts of the analysis, the raw data itself, the computing environment, and the analysis process. And so everything else I can tell you today is just going into the details of how I approach each of these components. Um, and so like the, the executive summary of all this is that you, you really just have to archive each of those components in an appropriate way and you're doing things reproducibly. And then the details that I'm get into is like, what's the appropriate way to archiving raw data? What's the appropriate way to archiving computing environments? And what's the appropriate way to archiving that analysis process? Um, so this is the rest of the story. Um, so for raw data, the sort of big picture, and the, you know, there's some subtle details that can be different, but the sort of big picture, usually um, I should give the caveat that most of the time I'm working with um, sequence data, so like high throughput DNA or RNA sequence data. Um, so I get data a lot from the Duke sequencing core. Um, sometimes I get publicly available data. Sometimes I get um, data from other sequencing cores or individual labs. Sometimes like I'm generating my own data. Um, but the first step is like actually getting the data, right? Almost never am I like, uh, well, I'm never generating computer on this, uh, generating data like on this computer or on the compute cluster, right? So the data has to get from wherever it was generated to the place where I'm going to do the computing. So that's the downloading part. Um, and the downloading part is important because it can be imperfect. Um, and again, I'm going to say this multiple times, but like almost everything I'm telling you today, I've learned from painful, painful, painful experience. Um, and like, hopefully you can learn from some of my painful experience and avoid some of the pain. Um, so, uh, downloading is error prone. And so you can try to download data and think you've got it all downloaded perfectly. And there can be um, errors that pop up. So like actually the data is like corrupted in one way or the other, or it's missing, partially missing, things like that. Um, especially for the type of data that I work with where it um, can often be very large files like 10, 50, 100 gigabyte files. Um, you know, those are the sorts of, that's the sort of data that's particularly susceptible to problems, you know, like the network hiccups and you, you end up like missing the last half of the data. So um, it's important to uh, try and get the data onto the computer you're using in a way that maximizing the likelihood that you've gotten it there. But then the next step is, is the data provenance, which is making sure, ideally, you have some way where the data was being generated. You have some way of, of um, generating a fingerprint for the data so that when you download it, you can check the data against that fingerprint and confirm that the, the data matches the fingerprint. I'm going to give you a demonstration of this in a few minutes just so it's a little bit more concrete. Um, if on the off chance, and this happens unfortunately to me, if on the off chance you get data that comes without a fingerprint, um, you know, there are a few different things you can do, but ultimately when I get the data, I want to generate a fingerprint so that that doesn't tell me that I got the data as it, the true data as it was generated, but at least I know what that from that point on, I have a fingerprint, so I can go back to that fingerprint and like in a month, I can check to be sure that the data hasn't been corrupted because sometimes that happens. Um, even, you know, if you're working on a cluster, whatever, um, I can confirm that the, the data that I have, you know, today is the same data as the data that I had a month ago. And so I have some, some confidence, right? Even if it's not the confidence that it's the data as it came off the machine that generated. Um, but ideally, and this is something that some people miss sometimes, you know, you have to know to look for that data fingerprint because 
it's pretty rare these days that that data generating, um, especially for big data, that data data generating companies or cores or whatever don't give you a um, a checksum, a fingerprint, but it does happen. Um, but often people don't realize what it is and don't know to look for. Um, and then the third part for like good um, care and handling of raw data is um, keeping it as safe as you can. Um, so like I said, you can't totally keep it protected from, um, from corruption, right? There are cosmic rays that hit disk drives and flip bits on the disk drive. Um, but you can protect it from like probably the most dangerous person, which is in my case me, because um, I do stupid stuff. Um, so every computer system that I know of, you can make files so that they're read only, which means that you can't accidentally change them without the computer saying to you, um, are you sure you want to change that? Because you said it's read only. Or like, if you want to change it, you need to like actually change it from read only to writable. Um, so that's one thing you can do to protect the data from yourself and from other people who, I'm not the only stupid person in the world, but um, I'm one of them. And so like, I want to protect the data from me and I want to protect it from other people who might, not stupid people, but stupid, you know, people who like make mistakes. Um, and um, then the last thing that, that I'll say in terms of data protection is you should really archive it as soon as possible. And I'll tell you what, a, saying what a good archive is is tricky. I can tell you what a bad archive is, which is archiving data on an external drive um, that that's the only place you're archiving it. And especially, I see this a lot, like you have an external drive, fill it up with really important data and you put it on a shelf somewhere. Um, that data that's on a shelf somewhere is like the least, the worst protected data ever because hard drives, hard drives especially, um, like to be working. They are mechanical devices. And if you leave them on a the shelf somewhere, uh, what happens is after year two, three, four maybe of just sitting there, they will um, mechanically like lock up and you can recover data from them um, for like a few hundred dollars some, sometimes, you know, like you can send it off to someone and they'll like do surgery on the drive and, and we'll recover data, but it's, almost always gonna be cheaper to like make sure you've archived the data in a safe way than to depend on just like a cheap um, backup drive. People often like see the prices for like backing up data like in a good way. And they say like, well, I can just go to Best Buy and buy a, a you know 20 terabyte hard drive for half that price. Um, but they don't account for the fact that, well, you're actually paying for someone who knows how to take care of the data and um, will make sure that it doesn't end up like actually disappearing when you thought you had a backup account. Um, any questions so far? I keep on, I realize that I'm not actually asking for questions and I'm dumping a lot of stuff on you. Okay. I'm totally clear. I don't see any questions on, on, um, on our, um, what's it called? Zoom. I knew there was a word for it. Okay, so now I am going to switch to our studio. Um, so I'm gonna do, oh heck, should I just show them how to pull the repo now, Janice? Okay, fine. I'll show you how to pull the repo now. Okay, um, so, now Janice is making me tell you to actually uh, get on DCC. Is there anyone who hasn't already logged on to DCC um, and opened our studio um, either here or on, on uh, Zoom? Can I assume that everyone's here? Okay. So I'm going to, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna, um, you are probably more someplace that looks like this, um, something like this. Uh, where it's, you're, oh, oh, 
that was exciting for a second, where it's just, I mean, you probably have less junk in here, but the basic idea you have like the R logging in um, and nothing here. Uh, so what I want you to do is go to this place, the place that this, um, this URL is taking you. If you weren't already there, can everyone see it? Do I need to make it bigger? So this is going to take you to the course um, Git repository. I'm going to explain a little bit what a Git repository is. Actually, I guess I won't really explain too much. Well, whatever. I'll explain a little bit. Um, so you want to be here, and actually, ultimately, you want to scroll to the top. Um, and uh, you want to come here. Um, Mine says copy SSH clone URL, but other people's might say something more like copy HTTPS clone URL. Um, if it says uh, if it says copy SSH clone URL, you want to click on this little down arrow here and select copy HTTPS clone URL, and then you're going to click on that button. Anyone not ready to go on? That's yeah, probably okay. It's possible that it. Okay. HTTPS. Anyone on Zoom having an issue? Anyone here in person having an issue? Okay. Um, so now you want to go back. I still have my R Studio in a, just a separate tab, which is kind of convenient for this. We're going to go back to R Studio, and uh, there are a couple different ways we can do this. I'm going to do it the. I don't know. One of the ways, if you go to the file menu, and this is the R Studio file menu, not the web browser file menu. Um, go to the file menu here and click on that, and then it'll pop up a little sub menu, and you want to select new project, and then click on that. And remember to yell if I'm going too fast. Okay. So now you should get a dialog box here that's asking you create a project and you want a new director, existing director, version control. We want version control. And then we want Git. And now you're going to paste what you copied in here. So on a Mac, it's going to com be command V. On a PC, usually it's control V, um, I think. Anyone not have that pasted in there? And it should say, you're not going to see the whole thing, but it should say, um, wait, did I do that? Yeah, I did it right. Um, no, that's not the way to do it. Interesting. And so if you like, apparently if you even just like move the arrow keys here, um, or uh, when your cursor is in there, if you push like the control key or the command key, it should normally like pop the the name of the repository here. So it should say 2023-2024 HIV workshop, um, which is exactly what you want. And then uh, it'll say create project as a subdirectory of, um, I like to, um, I like to, uh, um, uh, kind of organize my directories a little differently, but for the purposes of simplicity, I'm going to browse. Sorry. I, so uh, if, if you just have a tilde there, that's perfect. If not, then you can click on browse and then click on the home up here. And then click on choose. And then you'll get a little tilde there. I think you can also just type it. But. Um, you know, if you don't like typing. Um, because 
when you or are you going to talk about passing? About what? Passing. Not today. Okay. So, um, if you if you start doing a lot of coding, you'll, you'll move from machine to machine, especially if you've got something like that, you know, just, you'll clone it and, and in different places and update it. And if you're very consistent about how you clone your project, so you can put tilde your home directory, and then you put all of your projects under that. And if you move it from there, you move it to your, your Windows machine that says key colon users, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you go on to, say, a queue cluster where it's slash home slash your, your name. You don't have to change the copy of your code because it's all going to be everything relative to your to your home directory and the, the name of the um, project. So it's a really good idea to use it all up and not not ever give the full path name. There are other ways to do it too, but oh yeah, yeah. giving the full path name bad idea. Yeah. There are other ways to like manage that in a kind of nice way. But, um, Okay, anyone not have a dialog box that looks like this? Okay, then now you can click on create project and it should like do what mine just did, which is like throw a bunch of things up really quick and then like the screen will go blank like this and you get a little spinny thing and then our studio should open up. And the things that will be different are um, one up here in the top right, it'll say 2023 2024 HIV workshop. Um, so, our studio has this concept of a project. You can use, you might have used, I just hit myself in the face, uh, you might have used our studio before without using projects, but it, you get some benefits from doing things within projects, um, which we're going to, we'll talk about some later. Um, and so, you, from my perspective, including from a reproducibility perspective, you almost always want to be working within a project in our studio. And you should also see down here in the file pane, it's going to show you the project, the files and directories in the top level of, the, of that project directory. Okay, so I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to find, um, so the slides that I've been showing you were actually, I made them in our studio. Um, with a, they're in an R Markdown document, so I'm going to find those because we're going to do a little hands-on demo of um, data provenance and fingerprinting and security here. So um, I'm going to click on data science, and you can, just so you know, you can watch here, and this is going to show the path that I'm in. So I clicked on data science, now I'm going to click on reproducible. So you can see I'm in 2023-2024 HIV workshop, data science reproducible. And then I'm going to click on the reproducible research lecture.rmd. And that's going to open it here. I'm going to just click on this to make that get smaller. I'll check in Mondays. I don't think that's me. Um, okay. Anyone not here? Cool. Okay. And like I said, you don't have to, I just wanted you to, so you just did what's called cloning the repo. So you have a, in your account on Duke Compute Cluster, you have a copy of um, the course material so far, or the workshop material so far. We're going to update that. So we're going to have you update it, um, you know, every week, basically. Um, but basically, you have a working copy of it right now in your account um, on the Duke Compute Cluster. Um, so I'm going to scroll down here till I get to this part, which is switch to our studio. Oh, do I want to, oh, no, I can do it here. Okay. And, um, so you can run these chunks. I'm going to walk you, I'm going to tell you what's happening, um, or you can just watch. Uh, so I'm going to click on the run chunk button there. And it's going to run this chunk here. It's just going to gen generate two like toy files for us that we can play with um, that sort of provenance fingerprinting thing. Um, and I'll show you right now what those two files are. Um, they're both technically CSV files, um, but they only have one column, so you don't see any CSVs, comma separated values. 
Um, so normally you'd have the columns separated by um, commas, but here they each only have one column. So the column header is value. And then this is the data1.csv file and the values are one, two, three, four. Um, and then this is the data2.csv file and the values in it are five, six, seven, eight, right? Really simple files. We just want like some toy example files that we can play with. Uh, questions about that? And so if you ran that chunk now, you should have those same files on in your um, account on Duke Compute Cluster. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to run this function, run this program called MD5SUM. And this is the um, program that generates fingerprints. It's actually generating what's called a MD5 cryptographic hash. Um, that's a mouthful. What you need to know about it is that if you give it two files, if you put as input to this function, uh, or if you input to this function a file, it will always, for that file, if you haven't changed it, it will always give you the same output, which is this, I think it's like a 24, 32 digit um, combination of letters and numbers. Um, so if I run this again, and I can do it now, you'll see no matter how many times I run it, as long as that file isn't changed, I'm gonna get the same output. And so this is, this is the fingerprint or the cryptographic hash for the data1.csv file, and here's the fingerprint for the data2.csv file. And it doesn't matter what the file is named. So if I had three files that had exactly the same content, and when I say exactly, I mean exactly, exactly the same content as the data1.csv file, doesn't matter what they're named, you get the same output uh, here, except of course it was called like, you know, josh's file.csv, it would say this, and then josh's file.csv. But the, that function, that cryptographic hash function is, um, will give you a unique output for a given input. Um, and any change to that file, at all, like if you change a space, you will get a different output. So um, this is an awesome tool. So th this serves lots of purposes, but for our purposes, what we can use it for is we can have a 50 gigabyte file. We can run this MD5 sum program on it. It will give us this little short, you know, string of letters and numbers, and we can save that. And then, like I said, you know, we want to do in a month, I can run MD5 sum again. And if I got the same value here, I know that the file hasn't changed, right? And so the same thing that, like, ideally, um, you know, if I'm downloading uh, 100 gig file from the Duke sequencing core, um, they will, when they run the sequencing on the sequencer, once, that, once the data is off the machine, they'll run MD5 Sun. And when you download the data, they'll actually give you a file that has the MD5 Sum, these fingerprints. And so once I download the data, I can run MD5 Sum. I can confirm that my fingerprint matches the fingerprint as that they generated right when they ran the sequencer. And so then I can know that the download was successful. Right, I didn't miss any bits of the, there wasn't any like corruption of the file. There wasn't any like truncation of the file. I got exactly the data that was on their server. Does that make sense? Okay, so here we just, we just ran MD5 sum and it printed the results for us here. We're gonna do things how you'd like really wanna do it um, if you were, you know, wanted to keep a, a, tra a record of it which is we're gonna run the file and we're gonna save it. Sorry, we're gonna run MD5 sum on these two files and we're gonna save it to a file called mydata underscore md5.txt. And then this next line, so this is actually doing the same thing as this, but it's just saving it to a file. This is running MD5 sum in its like checking mode. That's what the dash C here means. Um, not gonna get into details about anything else about how to run it. But this, what this is doing is it's saying, okay, I have this file, my data md5.txt, the contents of it are gonna be just like that. And what I want you to do is I want you to 
load the, the fingerprints from that file, and now run, generate a new MD5 sum, a new fingerprint on the file, on the data1 and data2, data1.csv and data2.csv files as they are stored on the, on the file system, and tell me if those fingerprints match. And here it's saying for data1.csv, okay, that means the fingerprints match, like not, not a shock because I just made the files like five minutes ago and so it's unlikely it would be changed. And same thing for data2.csv. Right, okay with that, questions? Okay. Um, so now we're gonna make a, make a mess of things. So here is just a little command that I'm gonna do. Um, what it's gonna do is in the data2 file, we're gonna change, remember the data2 file was uh, 5678. So we're gonna change that seven to a three. Um, and that just happened. Now we're looking at the new, the contents of the data2.csv file, and you can see it's 5638, right? Not 5678. So just a little change, not a big deal, but now, when we run that MD5 sum check, it's going to tell us the data one file still good, but the data two file it failed, right? So it's different than that fingerprint. And it's not telling us anything about how it's different. All we know is that it's different. Um, if you want to know like how it's different, that's a whole different problem. Um, usually, I'm happy just to, I mean, like ideally, if there's a problem, I'd like to know what the you know, if there's a difference in the file, I like to know what the difference is. But, um, you know, if I've archived a copy of my file, I know that then I can just go back to the archive and download it from the archive again. Um, and it gives me this nice red warning that like one of the checksums didn't, didn't match. Questions about that? Okay, and so the next demo I'm gonna, give you is just showing you how you can make files so that they are read only, so you can't accidentally mess with them. Um, I'm not gonna explain too much here. I just wanna tell you that this is showing me for the, these are those files, the data1.csv, data2.csv, and the mydata underscore md5.txt. Um, this is the directory where they're in. It's just a sort of random directory. And this information here is saying, um, this R and W here means that the R is for read and the W is for write. So it means that I, as the owner of these files, can read and write those files. Um, these R's here say that everyone else on the computer system, including all of you, if you wanted to, could actually look at those files, look at my copies of the files, um, if you wanted to and you knew where they were. Um, but the fact that there's no W here tells you that you can't write to them. And the same thing here for the directory, this R and W is the same thing that you can read and write the directory. The X just means that you can actually like look in that directory. You can like, go in that directory. And so what you can see here is that all of you can read this directory and you can go to the directory but there's no W there, so you can't write to the directory. And writing to a directory, it kind of means something slightly different than a file. Um, and I should say, a directory is the synonym for a folder, so if you think of folders, then just when I say directory, think folder. Um, so writing to a directory means like actually putting files in it and taking and deleting files from it, right? Um, Usually, also, if you if a directory you can't write to it, it also means you can't edit files within a directory, although it depends on how the computer is set up. Um, so I'm going to run this program here called chmod, and it's going to, um, so you can see right now I can edit my own file. Seems reasonable. I'm going to run this program chmod, and you're going to see it's going to change the permissions. So now that W is gone, so I can't write to my own file. Now I could, since I own the files, I could change it back so I can write to them, but right now I can't. So like if I try and um, change that data to file to say this is not the data you were looking for, um, it, 
it's going to give me an, an error message saying, you know, permission denied. Like you, you don't have right from that's basically saying you don't have right permissions to that file. Um, if I try and change, do again what I did before, like change the seven to a three on the data two file, it's going to say, um, you know, no, you can't do it. You don't have right permissions. And if I try and delete that whole directory, it's also going to say you can't delete it because you don't have right permissions to the directory. And to delete the directory, you need right permissions to the directory. Right? So this is all like protecting it from everyone else on the computer, but also protecting it from myself. So pretty simple. Like I said, there are different ways. This is a Unix environment. So there's one way to use this, um, usually use this program, chmod. Um, on Macs and Windows computers, it's slightly different, but there's, you know, there's also a mechanism to make files and directories um, not uh, read-only, so that like you can't change things, other people can't change things. Questions about that? Okay, I'm just going to run this little chunk here that I'll kind of clean things up because otherwise I'll get an error message later. Um, and if there aren't questions, I'm going to switch back to what we're doing. No. Wait. Here's my. Hmm. Where are my slides? Did I? Are they in here? Maybe they're in here. Um. Uh, where the, oh, I know what. Oh, heck, I'll just do it this way. So like I mentioned, the slideshow is, is from this R Markdown document. So um, there, I just regenerated the slides. OK. So I'm going to skip all that because we just talked about it. Um, so then I told you the last part of this process is archiving the data as soon as possible. I just told you a little bit um, like a hard drive sitting on a shelf is not a good archive. Telling you what's a good archive is a little tricky, um, especially if you're at Duke. Well, at Duke, there I'm not going to get into details. Um, if people have questions, I can talk to them like during the break or afterwards. Um, there are different options. There are there are some options at Duke. You can archive data in the cloud, like AWS or Azure. They have like relatively cheap ways to like store data, especially if you're not accessing it. Um, one way, so like I said, I work almost exclusively with sequence data, and so um, NCBI, which is the National Center for biological information or something like that. Uh, it's part of the National Library of Medicine. I can never remember what NCBI stands for. Use it all the time. No, can't remember what it stands for. Um, so NCBI is part of the National Library of Medicine, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. And so they have um, sort of two major mechanisms for archiving sequence data, really three but we'll say two for now, just keep it simple. Um, and then they have some other ways to archive other types of data. I'm most familiar with the sequence data archiving mechanisms. So um, if you're working with any sort of gene expression data, so RNA-seq data, and oddly, I don't understand why, but chip-seq data, um, then your data and also microarrays, but probably no one here even knows what a microarray is, um, then it goes in um, in the GEO database. GEO is, stands for Gene Expression Omnibus. Um, any other types of sequence data you, you archive um, in, uh, in SRA, which is short for the Sequence Read Archive. Uh, there are links here from the slides. I should mention that, well, the slides are available because the, um, I'll actually show you how to get to the, oh, did I update it? Yeah, I think it's, anyway, um, the links you can link to from the, the lecture note versions of the slides if you want. Um, I, I keep telling people to do this, and this is the one thing, I do like pretty much everything else I'm gonna talk about today, so this is the one thing that I still haven't gotten off my butt and done, uh, but I keep telling people, if there's a mechanism, and sorry, the one thing I should say is if you work with a different type of data, 
there might be a way to archive it and there might not. I probably can't answer your question there. Um, actually, if you work with immunologic data, then there actually is a, um, I don't know if it's part of NCBI or not, but there's a, there's a um, database called import that will archive immunologic data. Um, there may be, a, anyway, if you work with other types of data, there may be a standard way to archive that data in a public way, and there may not be. Um, that's something that you kind of have to ask around people in your field and Google. Um, I can try and answer like I might know, but probably don't. Um, so I can tell you that for GEO and SRA, they will let you archive data and um, embargo it for five years. So like I can upload data today and I can say, I'm embargoing this data and I would embargo it for five years. Um, and so you've now archived your data, which um, the main reason for archiving the data is for reproducibility purposes. Um, so, and for most journals these days, they will require you to, for at least for sequence data, to archive your data in like one of these archives. And um, so you can't publish on the data unless you've archived it. Um, if you do it, the day that you get the data, then like that's the easiest day to do it. I can tell you from painful experience because like two, three years down the road when you're actually writing the paper, you got to like dig up all the, the, when you archive the data at, at SRA or GEO, you have to give them a bunch of metadata about like the experiments and how sequence stuff like that. And it's always hard to find that information two years down the road. Um, the other advantage of archiving the data immediately is that you basically have a free backup. Um, you know, they, it, it's not public if you don't want it to be, because you can embargo it. And, um, and you can download the data from the archive if you want. Um, and one of the nice things about that five-year embargo, if you're like on the fence of it, is it's actually like updatable. So if I submitted data today, what's today? The 20, the 9th, October 9th, so October 9th, 2023. So if I submitted data today, um, I can embargo it until October 8th, 2028. Um, I can log on November 1st. I mean, I can log on tomorrow, but let's say November 1st. And I can update the embargo to five years from November 1st. So then I can make it so that the embargo is until August 30th, 30th, 31st, August, August, October 31st, 2028. Um, so you kind of have, now, the one thing is that once you publish on that data, then you can't embargo it anymore. That's just the standard policy. But that's usually, you know, usually the journals are required. But the databases all will release the data even if you don't tell them to release the data. Um, okay. Questions about that? Um, so I'm going to go maybe a little bit further, and then maybe we'll take a break because you've been listening to me for a while. Um, so there are kind of alternatives to NCBI for sequence data, but all these databases sync up, so it sort of um, doesn't really matter where you submit the data. I will say at times in the past, the ENA interface has been a little bit nicer. So I've submitted data through ENA um, that it ultimately ends up in SRA, um, but it was just a little bit easier to submit it through ENA. Um, and like I said, for other types of data, maybe I can tell you where to put it, but probably not. Um, maybe we'll, how long do you think? 10 minutes break? Okay. And then you'll let me rant a little bit more afterwards. Thanks. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break. So it's 2.15 now. Let's come back at 2.25. I'm gonna set a timer so that, you know, I don't forget.
Yeah, that we can like feedback. Yeah. No, no, I was just going to say that hopefully between the three of us we can remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. He, but Richard's responsible for that. Right? Yeah. No, I know. But you're responsible for that. I don't have to worry about it. Do you have a, is there a URL that? Yeah, I'm going to try to. Okay. It's a long time. Okay. Hopefully everyone's back and had a very nice restful break. Um, okay. So I'm going to try and keep my ranting down so we can hand things over to Janice in a, like 10 or 15 minutes, maybe. Something like that. Um, so I told you that there are three pillars. The first pillar is data, um, raw data. The second pillar is the um, compute environment. And this is important um, because um, I, I think this happens less and less these days, but it used to be a big problem when I was just a wee graduate student, which is that if you had a um, particularly like Microsoft, like if you had a Microsoft Word file or PowerPoint, PowerPoint was terrible about this. And you like prepared it on a Mac and then you were presenting on Windows computer or vice versa, like it would, images wouldn't work, movies definitely wouldn't work, the like layout would be a mess. Do, has anyone experienced that here? Like definitely me. Yeah, I mean, I guess some of you are lucky that things have gotten a little bit better. Um, but the you has anyone experienced issues with like any sort of like moving between versions of programs or like on different platforms and like things don't work? I'm seeing some head shaking. Yeah. So this is a problem, you know, not just for Word and PowerPoint, but also for like data analysis software, including R and R packages. Um, and so so you can get one result and then you like upgrade to a new version and you get a different result. Um, hopefully it's not like a totally drastically different result, but like, you know, you can get changes in, um, in numbers, p-values, like, you know, significant genes, stuff like that. Um, so there are a couple different approaches to managing that. Um, the approach that I have landed on, again, after like years of pain, is containerization. Um, and the way I like to think of containerization is, um, actually, let me back up. Uh, um, OK. The way I like to think of containerization is, I'm just going to go back there. Um, it's kind of like I have, imagine for every project I work on, I have a separate laptop. And on that laptop, I have the software installed for that project. And so, like, let's say one project I'm using, I don't even remember what the latest version of R is, like 4.3 or something like that. So let's say, like, that, you know, this is, a, like, a new project. So I'm using R 4.3 and whatever version of Bioconductor is the current version. I can't remember. Um, and then, like, I have, like, another project that, like, I started, like, a couple of years ago. So for that one, I'm using R, you know, 3.2. And um, like that one, you know, the new project is my ductile platypus project. The um, older project is some project on, you know, I, I don't know, squirrels or something. And so like for the squirrel project that I started two or three years ago, I've got one laptop. For the ductile platypus project, I've got another laptop. And you know, again, for each project, I have like the software that I need installed. And so, you know, let's say that before lunch, I'm working on my Duckville Platypus project. So I get out the laptop for that and I work on it. And, you know, it's got all the software I need and the versions that I've been using for it. And then let's say, you know, I'm done working on that for now. I got to have my lunch. And then after lunch, it, I, I want to work on my squirrel project. So I get the squirrel project laptop off the shelf and I work on that. And then, 
um, by kind of having this separation, like two different laptops, I don't have to worry about the fact that, um, well, the Duckbill Platypus project is using our version, what is it, 4.3. The, the Squirrel project is using our version 3.2. And, you know, I don't have to worry that like, oh, well, actually, if I tried to run the Squirrel project analysis on a newer version of R, um, like maybe I'm going to get a slightly different result, or maybe even like the code doesn't work on the new version of R, so then I have to like fix some bugs and stuff like that. I don't have to worry about that. Okay, I got separate computing environments. Um, now imagine it's even better because when my lab mate comes to me and says like, I know you've been working on that Squirrel project for a while, and you were doing like this, that, and the other analysis for it. Um, I need to do that for my project. Um, can you tell me how to do it? And I can say, like, yeah, sure, I'll tell you a little bit. But I can also just like make a clone of my laptop for you. And so it's got the data on there. It's got the, the analysis software. And you can play with it. You can rerun the analysis in that paper that I published last year. And, um, you know, so you can get used to how that works. And then you can, you know, put in your data. You got the computing environment all set up and you can run your data in it. So you know that you have like a working environment, right? Or maybe they want to like work with my data anyway. And so like I got a magic machine that I can just put the laptop in, it'll like clone it and like actually make a new laptop that I can hand off to my lab. Um, so that's kind of what containerization does for you is that it, it allows you to have like this sort of lockdown environment that has specific versions of like all the software that you need. Um, you can have these different containers for different projects. Um, and you can move that. So that's the versioning. You can actually move that depending on the containerization system. You can move it between actually different types of computers. So like some containerization environments that you move between Linux Mac, Windows, some don't, um, but some do. Um, there are mechanisms for actually like sharing, not just like with my lab mate, but I can publish the computing environment, that container, so that when I publish my paper and I have the data on SRA, I can also put the computing environment on a, in a public place. And I can say, here's the computing environment. So you can download not just the data that I analyze, but the specific computing environment that I used with the right versions of all the software, you don't have to install anything except for the, the, um, this containerization software, which is generic. Um, and, and it also gives you this nice scalability feature that you can move it, you know, you can run it on your laptop. Um, you can run it on like a big server. You can run it on a compute cluster. Um, and again, I will give the caveat that there are a few different containerization systems. I'm going to talk about two in slightly more detail. And one of them, it's a little bit more easy to move between different um, scales and computers than the other, but the, the options out there. Um, so uh, the, the two major containerization platforms that I use and think about are, are called Docker and Singularity. And so you've all used Singularity, even though you don't know it, because um, this, the RStudio computing environment that we're using is actually running in a Singularity container. And the reason why we're doing that is because years and years ago, Janice, you might want to like cover yours because you're going to cry. So we, Janice and I have been teaching like this workshop and other workshops for many years. Uh, before we landed on using containerization, um, long, long time ago, you know, we'd have people bring their own computers and then they'd come and like, uh, you know, we'd ask people to install the software in advance and they, maybe they wouldn't have, or maybe they tried and didn't work or, but people would have like different versions of software installed. Um, and it was a nightmare. Um, it was a nightmare for teaching. And it's also that same sort of nightmare for actually doing research. Um, and so we're teaching this class you know, these, these workshops we're doing in containerized environment, one, because it makes things a lot easier. Like you bring your own computer, but it, you know, you can use whatever web browser you want, but the computing's actually done in a, a like common computing environment and everyone's using the same environment. Like you can 
muck it up and like change it so that you're not exactly doing the same environment. But um, like if if you kind of follow what we tell you to do, you'll all be using the same environment. Um, but the other reason that that I like to do it this way is this is how I do my research too. I use Duke, Duke Compute Cluster for almost all my research. I use containers running on Duke Compute Cluster for almost all my research. And I do it because it gives me this nice reproducible computing environment that I can ultimately share with other people. I can you know, hand, hand to collaborators, colleagues, students, say like here, this environment works for me. It should work for you too. Um, so like I said, there, there, there are two main platforms. There's Docker and Singularity. For Singularity is really, Docker is older. Um, it's really kind of targeted at the like sort of like IT professionals who are, you know, like Amazon and Netflix, you know, like big companies and small companies, they use uh, Docker under the hood for a lot of things. It's not quite as good for researchers, which is actually why the people who developed Singularity developed it. Um, because, for example, if you went to the people who run Duke Compute Cluster and you said, I want to run my Docker container on Duke Compute Cluster, uh, you know, I've been working on my laptop, got all set, I want to run on Duke Compute Cluster, they'd laugh at you and they'd say no. Because the way that Docker works is that it, it needs you to have like a level of access to the computer like the people who administer it um, and they don't trust you or me or anyone else with that level of access. So Singularity lets you be a regular user and run containers. Um, and it was, it was developed specifically for that purpose so that you can like go on a cluster and you don't have to have any sort of special privileges. You can run Singularity containers. Um, so for the most part, I actually use Singularity because I do most of my work on GCP cluster. Um, and it does make things all simpler. So like I said, that there's, you know, like, Docker's a little bit better of at being able to move. You can run Singularity on a Mac and on a PC. It's like slightly more work. Um, Docker's a little bit easier to move between operating systems. Um, but in terms of like the sort of scalability from like your local computer to a cluster, Singularity's a little bit better about that. Um, that's all you need. You, as far as you know, I've just told you, you know, like I said, I've just told you that you're actually all using Singularity, um, but it's sort of like invisible for us um, in the in this workshop, and that's really the way it should be. Um, so you don't necessarily have to worry about the fact that you're running in a container um, a lot of the time, but every once in a while, sometimes you do. Uh, I kind of already just went through all this stuff. Um, questions about containers and reproducible computing. Oh yeah, okay, here. So we're getting to the, remember our way back at the beginning, I started something and I said I was gonna tell you about it later. So now I'm gonna tell you about it. So that was a, a demonstration that, maybe I should wait till the end. You know, now we'll talk about it. Um, that was a demonstration of reproducibility. So that, for, for that, let me see if I can find it. Okay, so this is that window that I started in the beginning. It churned for like maybe 20 minutes or something like that. It downloaded a data set. This is an analysis that I did. This is like my like, you know, beautiful example of reproducibility. It downloaded the data set. It downloaded the code that it needed to use to analyze the data set. And it downloaded the, um, the Singularity container, and it ran the code in the Singularity container on the data set, all, you know, I just had to like, you saw I had like, I ran like five commands. I really could have probably done that in like two or three, but made it a little fancier to do five. Um, and we can take a look at it. So you won't be able to find this, but, well, maybe you can, I can't remember. Let's not worry about it. Uh, here. It's here. This one? Yeah. No, nah, because you don't need it. Okay. I don't. I don't know if it's. It might be public. Uh, it might be readable. Just, just sit back and relax for two minutes. 
Okay, we're just going to look really quick at the output. It should be in here. Is it here? Yeah, here. Um, so this is a um, the best one. We'll do that one. Um, so all of these are like the output files. It's all, all the analysis was done within our Markdown document. So you can, as you're going to see, if you don't know already, you can knit our Markdown document to generate these reports. So here's the code and then here are some nice figures. This is a kind of basic microbiome analysis. Uh, so here are alpha diversity plots. Um, here are the same thing as Bach plots. Here's like looking at alpha diversity as a function of on the x-axis the these samples were collected at different elevations of soil samples. Um, and this is like the soil depth at which they were collected. We'll look at one more and then we'll move on. Oh, that's not a good one. Uh, let's see the relative buttons plots I think are nice. Um, so here, same data set, just some other figures. Uh, this is the um, absolute abundance of different taxa. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. I just want to show you pretty pig pretty figures for now. Um, here, it, these are normalized. So here's like the um, the relative abundance of a bunch of different bacterial phyla. In the x-axis here is different samples. That figure looks terrible. Um, here's a slightly nicer looking version of figure. Again, it's like different bacterial phyla. Um, here's a like slightly cleaner version of that. Where, what do I want to look at? Anything else? Uh, that's good. Um, so, oh, here's genus level. Different bacterial genera. Um, the point I want to make is that you can actually, you know, it took some work to actually get it so nice that you could run two or three commands, all the data gets downloaded, the computing environment gets downloaded, the, um, and the scripts get downloaded and it all runs. I can also do this uh, on my local computer, but my computer's been like a little wiggy recently and sometimes it spontaneously crashes. So that made me a little bit nervous about running it while I was trying to uh, show you slides from it. But it is, this analysis is pretty portable too. Um, and really the, the, the reproducibility of it is for sure the data and having the code available, but having that computing environment, so I don't have to like sit here and install a bunch of software um, to like run the analysis, that's like a major part of, of the reproducibility. Uh, where are my slides? There are my slides. Any questions about that? Everyone's just odd. Great. Okay. I'm going to keep going so that I can give Janice a chance to talk. So third pillar is the analysis process. Um, my sort of like high level overview for making analyses processes. And when I say analysis process, I'm going to talk about this more in a second, but I mean like the, the code that you write to do the analysis. So like R code, Python code, um, shell scripts. If some of those things don't mean anything to you, that's okay. Um, but like the, you know, I don't mean, when I, when I talk about a con, like a container and a container is computing environment, that's like usually software that other people have written that you're installing. Um, here, when I talk about the analysis process, I'm talking about like the specific code you write to do the analysis. Um, and so the like, correct, uh, my sort of approach to this is that you, everything should be written, all the analysis should be written as code, um, that you should share everything, the code and all the bits, the sort of accessory bits that you need. So like, for example, if there's like a configuration file that you load as part of your code, you need to share that. If there's like a metadata file, that's, there's sort of like a blurry line between of metadata, I think of as a sort of blurry between data and code, um, but or like kind of configuration. Um, but like all the parts that you need, right? Just having the code itself. If there's like some configuration information that you need or like parameters that you need, then it 
if you don't share that those extra little bits, then it's not going to be reproducible. Um, and then uh, part of this making it reproducible is having version control, which I'm going to try and describe a little bit now, and I'll try and describe a little bit more um, next week. Um, so, like I said, ideally, you every, all of the analysis is done in some form of code. Um, and here are just a few different options. You don't, I don't always use all of them, and you don't have to use all of them. You can use other things. Um, I really strongly recommend um, against using Excel to actually analyze data. Um, it's pretty dangerous for a lot of reasons. So one is I'm not going to uh, th – this link here, um, when you go in the notes, links to an article about um, a couple of really famous uh, economists who did this analysis. Um, I mean, this is now more probably 15 years ago that they published, and um, it ended up in the results of this publication ended up informing decisions that were made in the last financial crisis, the 2008 financial crisis. Um, a graduate student at another institution some years afterwards decided just for like a course they had to like download some data, some published data and like analyze it or reanalyze it. And so a graduate student downloaded the data for this project and analyzed it. And they saw that um, the original authors had um, messed up like columns or rows or something like that. And at least according to this graduate student, if you change, if you fix that, those mistakes, which are really easy to make in Excel, um, then the outcomes are different. And then potentially the like hypothesis of this paper, which informed decisions that countries made about their economies in the financial crisis, the conclusions are different, um, at least according to this graduate student. I'm not an economist. I haven't reanalyzed the data, but there is some controversy in the field about this. But, you know, potentially there were decisions that were made about um, how to manage an economic crisis by countries um, that uh, were the wrong decisions because someone made an Excel, a mistake in Excel spreadsheet. I, I'm pretty sure that nothing I ever do will like have that much consequence. And yet, I think it's actually important to like make sure my data analysis is reproducible. Um, and so Excel is really dangerous. I'm not saying I never use Excel um, like for like the list of people participating in this class. We got an Excel spreadsheet, but like for data analysis, no. Um, okay, and I kind of already said this already. Right when you share when you're sharing things, it's not just the code that's doing the analysis, but you also need to have whatever net metadata is important, including like configuration information, parameters, stuff like that. Sometimes that information is actually just captured in the code itself. Um, you need some sort of documentation so that like someone that's trying to reproduce your analysis knows what to do, right? Because if you just have the code there and they're like 30 different files and no explanation, then it's not super helpful. So like, for example, that, that demo that I gave you, the documentation could be as simple as run these five lines and it will reproduce the analysis. That would be fantastic if I had like more details about like what's going to get downloaded, what like what decisions were made and stuff like that. But at least if you have that documentation, you can re reproduce the analysis. And if reproducing analysis gets you a long way towards like actually having well, of course, reproducibility, but actually like people being able to do useful things with it. Because if you have code that you don't know how to run, the first step is getting it running. If you have code that runs, then you can then start picking apart what it's actually doing when you know that it works and you can play with it. But if it doesn't run or you don't know how to run it, then you, that's a big step towards actually working with that code. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I've already told you like three times that this slideshow was generated. I wrote this in our markdown. So you can also generate, well, and I showed you with the demo, you, you can generate reports. You can actually also generate like Word documents from our markdown. So you can make manuscripts 
with the figures automatically like updating and even like if you have numbers in the in the document so like you know you like have in the document like say like well we studied you know we looked at a hundred or a hundred mice and 38 percent of them had like a positive response to whatever treatment is and those numbers some of you have probably experienced this before you know you you run the analysis and you get the numbers and you put them in the manuscript and then someone says well you know really we should do the analysis this way and so you like you redo the analysis and then you have to remember to update the numbers in the in the manuscript and if you don't then like it's actually you know the figures in the manuscript and the like text don't necessarily match up. So you can actually set up um, our markdown so that those numbers actually get plugged in directly. Um, now, probably some of you are thinking like, okay, well, that's great, but like I collaborate with people or I don't know how to use R or I collaborate with people who don't use R. Um, me too. Janice, you don't work with anyone who doesn't know how to use R, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so I realize there's reality. Like most of the time you actually, like I have to work with people who want manuscripts, uh, want to you know write the manuscripts as a Word document every once in a while now, but most of the time. So you can always like do a first draft as R and like try and get things down and then export it to a Word document. It's an option, like I say, that's like really nice for reproducibility, but you know there's the real world. So um, just putting it out there, they can do it. Uh, how long? Maybe I'll skip that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to explain really quickly what version control is, and then I'm gonna hand things over to Janice. Um, and then I'm gonna try to explain again on, so if you don't understand it today, next Monday I'm gonna explain it again. Because um, next Monday I'm gonna do a demonstration of Git, which is a version control system. So this is one way of thinking about version control. Uh, anyone ever experienced this? <laughs> like, yeah, okay, we all have. So I'll say that that um, when I took a, uh, I, I, the intro computer science class that I took in college, the professor had one piece of good advice. I mean, there's probably others, but there's one piece of good advice, which is let computers do what computers do well, and you know you should do what humans do well. Don't try and do as a human things that computers can do well and you can't. Uh, so doing things like this, like naming documents and keeping track of versions and stuff, we are not good at. We are terrible, like anyone ever, like, I think the last time I gave this talk, it was like a day or two after I'd like been working on like a PowerPoint with like a bunch of like, like five other people. And like, there were three versions floating around and someone had updated one version, one of the version and someone else had updated another version. We're like, which one's the which one's the right version and which one's the most up to date, right? So like, we're bad at this. Um, computers are actually quite good at this. Um, and so version control manages this sort of thing. So you don't have to like name files, like this is the final version of the document. Um, the computer keeps track of it and you can go back and Version control lets you go back to earlier versions of the document, but you don't have to like remember, well, what was the name of that file? There, it, ver, a good version control system actually has mechanisms that allow you to kind of like roll back in time and, and know what the current version document is and share it. Um, that like we're bad at doing this sort of stuff that we all do by email with Word documents and crappy file names. Uh, so that's one way that version control is helpful. I will say, just as a little bit of a caveat for the version, get the version control system we're going to talk about. You can put any sort of document in it that you want, but it does the best. That, like you can use all of its features with text-based documents. So a Word document, which is what dot doc implies, is a Word document. It's actually, it looks like text, but there's actually, if you can dig into the file, there's all sorts of information in there, like the fonts and stuff. Um, so technically it's not really a text document. Um, and so you can version control that in Git or other version control systems, but you do lose some of the, um, some of the nice benefits. So like, for example, well, I'm gonna show you in a second. 
Um, the, so a good version control system lets you sort of like track changes over time, lets you sort of back up to old versions and like compare the current version to the like three versions ago or three versions ago to five versions ago. Um, if you want to, you can like roll back. You can say, I want to get rid of all the changes that I made in the past week. I don't know what I was doing, but that version a week ago was better. Um, or, you know, you realize that like you, well, you, you know, you realize that you like made a mistake a week ago or you like made some changes that you decide, ah, that wasn't a good idea. Um, it lets you do this thing called branching that you can kind of like have a working version and then you can work on a side sort of experimental version. Um, and this applies to code, it applies to tech, you know, manuscripts. It can be, again, it can be any sort of document. Um, good version control systems let you collaborate in the sense that like you can all be working on a system, on a document together, kind of like Google Docs. Um, kind of like Google Docs, not quite. Um, and it actually, good version control systems actually have mechanisms for publishing. So you can say, here's my code. Um, you know, when you, when you write your manuscript, you can say, here's my code, um, and point them, point the readers to a version control system where you've actually made your code publicly available and all the other documentation, stuff like that. Um, so just as a little example here, so here's from like, uh, this slideshow, I mean, this is like years ago now, but, um, what you see here is that the version control system here is showing um, the current version of the document um, where there are changes. The current version is in green. The previous version is in red. And then like this stuff that's in white and gray, you can kind of ignore. So you can see here that like, this is one change I made um, to this one line here. Here's another change I made. Here's another change I made. So you can, this is super easy to do in Git, the version control system that we're gonna be talking about next week. Um, and just like one of the really nice benefits. So this is kind of like, you know, a little bit like tracking and um, track changes in, in a Word document, uh, but it works way better. Um, I can tell you that. I've done both, it works better. Uh, so we're gonna be, Again, we're going to be talking about Git next week. I'd say it is by far the most popular version control system on the planet right now, um, at least software version control system. Um, the second runner up is probably Mercurial. Not that many people use Mercurial anymore, so not anymore. Really? Yeah. <laughs> One of our colleagues. Um, there were some nice features of Mercurial, but Git. One. Uh, so these, there. Again, we're going to talk um, next week about actually. Uh, I'll just wait till next week. Um, okay. So I'm going to spend one minute talking about organization and hand things over Janice. Um, so I have a strategy. Again, this is the way I like to do things. I have a strategy for like organizing my file. Um, which is that I have a directory and sometimes subdirectories that I put the raw data in and I make that read only. Um, it drives me nuts. Well, so, and then I have a separate directory. When I do the analysis, usually I try and script everything. And so the analysis is actually the code is going to go in the Git repository. Again, we're going to talk about that next week. Um, but the code and sometimes the metadata will go in the Git repository. And then there's a third or here second directory, which is the output directory that's where the results go. Because for things that I do, as far as I'm concerned, the output directory is totally disposable. Um, for me, like a long running analysis, there's actually an analysis I ran over the summer that was gonna take a couple of weeks to run and then they shut down the computer system. That's a different story. But you know, a long running analysis for me is like usually like, half a day, day, maybe two days. Um, I don't pay, I have access to the compute cluster, so I don't directly pay for like running computations. I'm killing the planet because it uses electricity, but you know, um, that's a different discussion. Um, but if I have my data and I have my code, I can always repeat the analysis. 
And so the output is, as far as I've con I'm concerned, totally disposable. Um, so I really like to have the output separate because sometimes I actually want to delete the output and rerun the analysis from scratch to make sure that I didn't change something because I've done this before, change something. I'm not, I'm running the analysis, but I'm not running it all the way from the beginning. And it turns out that I changed something that broke the like first step of the analysis. And I think I'm just working on step three, but I broke step one. And until I rerun everything, I don't realize that I broke step one because I'm working on the output from step two. Um, and the output from step two is just right there. So every once in a while, I'll just delete all the output, rerun the analysis from scratch. Um, and so it's important to have these things, I think, to have these things separated. One, because um, raw data is like the, you know, it's like the Mona Lisa. You don't touch it. You look at it, um, but you don't touch it, right? It's hanging on the wall there. If you try and touch it, like a security guard's going to get unfriendly with you. Um, the code, you know, you, you're going to change it, but you need to keep it under version control. Um, the output, like I said, is disposable. Now, there are some research projects for which, you know, maybe you have to run the analysis six months, so we can argue then about whether it's disposable or not, but um, certainly, if, you know, if it only takes a few hours to rerun an analysis, that's disposable, especially if you've set things up in a nice reproducible way, so you don't have to, all you have to do is like type a command and hit enter to rerun the analysis. Um, and then the rest of the slides here are just, you can get to them, actually I'll show you in the notes, there are links to other like resources, um, like some, some other perspectives on things. Let me show you how you can find the notes. Um, I mean, you can find the slides, but it's actually, I think, a little bit easier. Here I go, data science, reproducible. Actually, no, there's a better way to do this. Here, the, this is the, the page where we started off, this is the, the Git repo. Um, if you click on data science workshops, do people need me to give you the URL again? Or you already have the tab open. <laughs> Nobody needs the URL again. Great. Okay. So uh, data science, um, reproducible analysis lecture, and then here. This just takes you here. So this is like the sort of note version. It's got the slides, just not as individual slides. So there are a bunch of links down, there are links throughout, but there are a bunch of links down here at the bottom to like um, other opinions on, on how to organize projects, um, some explanation about Git, uh, which you can probably wait to next to read if you want. A uh, couple of articles from, I think, PLOS, Computational Biology on best practices for scientific computing and good enough practices for scientific computing. I don't know if I even do good enough, but um, I try. Uh, any questions before I hand the mic over to Janice? Good afternoon, you all. Do we want to let them have a break or? Uh... Uh, you know what, myself, I've got something on my computer and I always. Five minutes? I always have an issue with the data. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, so five minutes. Five minute break. Five minute break. Uh, so three oh nine, three ten. You're giving them six. You generous. I'm giving me six. Okay, that's legit. So I broke this one. Do you want to use that? Um. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to use that? Yeah, I'm gonna get out of the way. Yeah, I probably am gonna use what we call like. I usually plug in here. Okay. That's the one thing that I've never found a better place. It's not a good place. It's not a good place. I don't think there's any other place.
Charles, can you that big off, please? Yeah. I think this is like... Oh, do I need a converter? Or do they have a um, USB-C? To... No, they have it, right? They have it. It did not work for me. I have one I can, in my bag. I can give you mine if you... I have one in my bag. You can try. It's, are these different? Um, they're different in that math. You said that one of them works and one of them does okay. not. But neither of them worked for me. Okay. But maybe I wasn't patient enough. I just want to say, like, put up the, the QR code. Yeah. So, so that's what we'll try to remember. Uh, I'll also remember. But everybody I just wanted to be, it not be surprising if I try to like, interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you can always interrupt me. Um, yeah, that doesn't seem to be working. Oh, but oh, I have to forget. I always forget you have to do this something with this too, right? Only because here is that a Linux? Of course. Linux from here it is. Hmm. Yeah. No, it should be that, right? Yeah. Huh. Okay, that's not working. Can, can I just try yours, actually? You're, you're not leaving, right? No. Okay. It's not quite the right one yet. Well, I can't help you with that. There we go. Too loud, right? Or is it too loud? Okay. I put it. I ended up putting it down a little bit. Yeah. Okay. How how do I do that? I think you can also adjust the volume, but I just put it. No, I just put it like lower on my shirt. Oh, I see. All right. I want the kind you wear the headphones. I can pretend I'm a 1980s aerobics instructor. <laughs> okay, let me see. I don't know. Here? How's that? Is that slower? Yeah, really. Ah. I don't know where to put it. How about there? Better? A little bit? Okay. Try to talk loud. <laughs> okay. And we went to sleep over here and wake up. Oh no, come on. Oh, because now it's. So my laptop screen, instead of being on my laptop, it's now on these monitors, but I think I can deal with that. Okay, it is 310. A couple people still missing now, right? Still one or two people out? Yeah, definitely. Okay. I'll wait. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. All righty.
Okay. Well, I want to start. The people, not everyone's back, but you shouldn't have to wait, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so we're back on the DCC container, and over here in the lower right, you have your files menu. Um, if you want to get to where I am quickly, you can just click home, and then I have many more of these than you do probably, but click on the 2023-24 HIV workshop. And now you're in the top directory for the workshop. And if you click on data science, data science portion, and then introduction. So you were in reproducible before for, for um, Josh's talk. OK. And then the files that we're going to be looking at first is going to be, yeah. Uh, oh, my gosh. Wrong. It might be like, I might a little bigger. It's too small. Um, okay. Um, I don't know if I can. Can I just? Is that good? You can go to the I know, but then does that change every all the files? Maybe. All right. Let me just. Okay, that's what I just did. So let me just redo that. Okay, is that okay? Good. Okay. All right, cool. All right, and so the um, the file we're going to look at first is um, the R demo, and this is again, this is the part where unless you understand the code already, just don't don't try to read it. It's it's just this is just for demonstration purposes to get you an idea of what what we want to get to. So um, actually, first I should because um, we didn't introduce this before. Um, how many people have worked with R Markdown notebooks before? This is incredible. Yeah. I mean, like, like even just a year ago, it was like nobody. Okay, I've got, yep, people online too. Okay, cool. All right, well, so this is an R Markdown notebook, and since you've worked with them before, you know that there are, there's this um, stuff in the beginning that gives you the, the title, author, date, lots of things you can put in there. Um, and, then, um, and, then, and then you have code chunks, which look like this. With the, can you see my cursor here? Good. Um, with these like back ticks and it's a, it's a really weird looking thing, but that, that's where you put your code. And then you have the markdown chunks where you can put a lot, lots of text. And um, I don't know if any, did anybody notice that um, Josh was running um, Unix commands from his notebook? Yeah, so he was. So you don't have to just run R. If you go over here to code, um, bash, that's Unix shell, shell scripts. You can put in Python chunks. You can put in RCCP. RCPP is, um, is a C++ interface for, for R. Um, that's really useful if you're doing something that's really compute intensive um, because R is a scripted language and compiled languages tend to be faster. So um, that's sometimes scientific programmers will use that. You can use SQL. There's a statistics package called SAN. So, I just want you to get the idea that's not just R you can use this for. In fact, they're moving now from R Studio to some, it's called Posit, right, Josh? Yeah. So, so that's a, to give you the idea that this is actually a much bigger platform. It's not just R. Um, so I'm going to knit this and just so you can see the output, and then we can go through it line by line. Uh, I'm not used to working. We only have like two cores and like, what, it was a two gig of RAM or something. And, uh, when I when I fire up a container, I'm usually like, yeah, I'll take 40 cores and about 200 gigabytes of RAM. So like, thank you very much. That's me. Yeah, <laughs> I need it. Okay, so this is what the knitted document looks like, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at this HIV data set. Um, this I I pulled off of this um, this website, uh, Vincent. I can't really read his name, but this, this person has a um, GitHub repository with a bunch of R data sets. And uh, more than are available with, well, I don't know, there's not, some are available there that are not available in R. Because, you know, you can install a data set in R. But um, these were just um, some CSV piles, files I pulled down. And I thought that was great because most of the time when you're going to be working in R, you're going to be reading in either an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV. Um, that's how you're going to get your data in. So rather than you know giving you like the 
the toy data sets that are already in R. You don't actually get to see how the, how the data gets there in the first place. Okay. So, um, so I'm, I'm just referencing this. So this is the, where I got the files from, and I took this quote to tell you what the files are about. Um, these are um, the, um, the time and years for HIV, from HIV infection to AIDS. So this was, a, I think, did I say, I feel like it was in Amsterdam, but I'm not seeing any, the reference to it. But it is. Oh, okay, so great, okay. So, um, so they had um, 329 men who had sex with men, and the data are from the period until ART was available. And so they were looking at time to progression to AIDS, and they were also looking at this other, um, uh, this other thing, which is uh, uh, somebody in here in Dozich, I'm sure. Think it. Uh, it, okay, just say what it is. Um, the T cell, at some point, at some, certain points in the in the in the infection, T cells go um, multinuclear, and they get like this sort of like clustering, and that often happens in the initial infection, and or is a precursor to going into AIDS. And so they were looking at that, and um, we have a few other things in this file that we could look at. Um, so I'm going to go now to the code so that we can execute line by line instead of just looking at the um, looking at this. Oh, yes, I have to tell you something very important. Um, so this file, you can't change this file. <laughs> or you can, but if you do, you're going to get something called merge conflicts when you try to pull the repo on I change things again. Because if you make changes locally to this file under this name, the next time I ask you to pull from the Git repository, you will understand that sentence much better next week. Um, I ask you to do that. Yeah, Git is going to say, hey, you have changes on your machine that aren't in the re repository. And you're not going to be able to fix that by putting your changes in the repository because you don't have access. So what you need to do, if you want to change anything, or even just to be safe, um, go into your file and, um, menu and save as. And you know you can either put your name, maybe I'll put my name um, here. So now you'll be working in a different version of the file. And then when you pull down, this won't be on the Git repo. It'll just be in your file system on your, you know, on your DCC account. But now it will be, wait a minute. Huh, I must have hit the wrong thing. Nope, I didn't, there it is, okay, okay. Um, so, so now you have, you'll be working in this, this will be your working copy for the file. Because even if you like put, I, I think even if you run out and, and have output in it and then it, it auto saves or you save it, then that's going to be considered a changed file and then Git's going to be upset about it. So well, don't worry if you do have, if that does happen, there's a very easy way to fix it. It's called Git stash. You can do that. But um, you, you'll see you'll see angry messages and we'll fix it. It's not a big deal. Okay. So again, the code chunks. Okay. So the first thing I want to do. Well, cursor isn't okay. There we go. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to read in uh, the packages uh, tidyverse and read R. These are two tidyverse is um, the suite we'll be working with. It's almost. <laughs> In many ways, for this purpose of this course, tidyverse is almost synonymous with R, because that's what we're going to be learning. Okay, so I'm just going to load those libraries so we have those commands. And then I'm going to read in this file. So you have this as part of the repo. I, I added the data file to the repo. It's not something you usually do. Like Josh was saying, you usually archive your data in some kind of data repository. Um, so, um, but... <laughs> so this is this is a cheat that I that I do a lot. Is I, I if I have a small data file, um, especially if it's part of a test data set, I will just put it put it in the in the Git repo, and then I can have it back and forth whatever machine I'm working on. So I'm just going to read in the CSV file, and R gives me a bunch of you know information. I can suppress this warning if I want to, but it's just telling me what columns it read in and what the types are. Um, and now if I just want to have a look at it, in R, you just put the, the name of the variable in, and you can, and it, it just, the default function it does is print. 
So there's row names in here, which we really don't need row, na row names. I guess that was, I don't know why, that, that was probably an, um, an artifact when they put it into a CSV file. Um, a patient number, entry time, that's the entry into the study. Um, the AIDS time, so that's, that's the time it took <clears throat> from, I think, I believe it's from the entry time until, the, until AIDS uh, um, uh, occurred. And then, oh no, where's AIDS? Okay, I might be wrong about that. Um, this is the time, SI time is that time that the, the, this, this sort of like multi-nuclear kind of thing happened. And so it either happens or it doesn't. So that's what the status is. And if it doesn't happen, then this time is, is simply the last, the last follow-up appointment or, um, or as you can see for this particular patient, these two patients, it's death. Um, and then the death, oh, I see. Actually, I'm sorry, it's not death. It's the last follow-up because here also the death status is no, is zero. So this person is still alive, and his la their last appointment, his last appointment, was was um, eleven years, eleven point three five years after um, the entry into the study. Um, and then there's the age of infection, the age in which the per person was infected, and they have the CCR genotype, so CCR five. So you're all HIV researchers, you probably know, but I, so this is the mutation which makes it more difficult. The CCR5 receptor is necessary for um, entry into viral entry into the CD4 cell, and if you have um, the, a double mutant mutation, you're essentially immune to HIV. Um, and so, y, W is wild type, and M is mutant. So we have some people who are homozygous, um, homo, homozygous wild type, and then you have uh, hetero, heterozygous, or one wild, one mutant. Um, you can just look at the column names. So I'm just basically doing what I would do for an exploratory. Okay, what columns have I got? And as I said before, we don't need the row names. That's, that's kind of a, um, that's an old, we used to have row names all the time, but they're not really used for anything. So we're going to get rid of that. So here I'm just getting rid of the row names, hmm. saving it into a different data frame. And now the first column is um, patient number. Um, and now I'm just going to do some, some counts. Of um, to, to to find out like how many patients have a particular status. Um, so I use the group by summarize um, idiom, which you're going to see a lot. It's very very useful. I use it constantly. Um, oh, and in R in the Markdown notebook, if I want to see the first output, I just have to click on this square. So this is the SI stat. So there are 215 people who did not have this um, result. Um, so they, they never got to this, this mononuclear state <clears throat> during the course of the study. Because I guess some of them could have been infected. If it had an early infection and they were entered into the study later, just didn't, we probably just didn't observe it. Um, and then 114 have it. Um, for, age, for AIDS, um, 122 patients had not progressed to AIDS at the time the study closed, um, and 207 had. And then CC, CCR5, you can see that for, I guess for five people, they, they probably didn't get the genotype or, or something, but so that's why there are five NAs. Um, there's 65 heterozygous and uh, 259 have wild type. And here, I just want to, I'm just going to show you that, that you don't have to just, so those were all grouped by summarize and I had a count. Here's group by summarize. You can also do a mean. So you can do any kind of summary of the data um, with this idiom. Um, so the average age of onset, I, um, and I found this interesting too. So, because I decided to group it by um, whether or not they had progressed to age, I wondered if there was any difference in, in age of um, age of infection versus how long, whether or not they progressed to age. Um, and they're clearly, according to the average, there isn't. But then I'm like, well, okay, average is only good for like certain types of distributions. What's the, what do the distributions look like? So um, here's a distribution of, of ages overall. So this is, and this is my favorite thing to just see like how powerful GDPLOT is because this is literally this is three lines of code. Um, once the data is into a nice clean format. I can get this, this histogram really easily. 
and because I've made everything so big, it doesn't fit in the window. Um, but so this is just a, a histogram on uh, at the age uh, of the age of infection throughout the entirety of that, right? And so I was like, okay, well, I can see it's a little bit, maybe it's a little bit skewed, right? Um, age of infection seems a little bit, you know, skewed a little, little bit younger. Um, and then I thought, well, and I also, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, yeah, but now with, with just one more, so this is, GG, again, ggplot, with one more line of code, this guy, I can say, well, how does it break down um, for, for HIV uh, AIDS status, whether or not they got HIV? And there it is. So I've got now two different distributions. Um, these people did not progress to AIDS. These people did. Um, and the age distributions, um, to me, still don't look very different. So that was kind of confirming that the average was maybe giving me the right answer. Um, again, this is exploratory. I'm not making any hypotheses or anything like that. Um, I have to say that or Richard will come and shoot me. Uh, <laughs> um, and I think, I'm just wondering, one of these just didn't really work very well. Let's see what happened here. I have to remember now. Um, so maybe somebody can debug it for me. Um, so here it is. So he, here I've just made it a little prettier. And I've done that by, um, by adding this aesthetic where I colored by their HIV status. Oh, my, my trackpad is freaking out on me. All right, there we go. And so you can see, like, with just one line of code and just a little bit of more code, I've made it a little bit prettier. Um, but there's a little bit of a problem here because it's it's looked at this this AIDS status as um as a continuous variable. So I've got this this, this you know from zero to one with fractional values in there, and so it's just kind of shading it. Um, and I, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to look at it as a categorical value variable and R we call it a factor. Um, and let's see. Hold on. Oh, did I? I didn't get there yet. Sorry. I was gonna. I was just actually showing in this one that um, got ahead of myself. Um, we can change the names of things. So, so I I put a title in distribution of onset of AIDS, and and then the X label I put in as um, age of start of infection, so that it doesn't have age dot inf because that's you wouldn't certainly wouldn't publish that. Um, so you can manipulate titles and things like that. And then I think. <laughs> this this one worked fine. Yeah. Okay. So this one worked fine. So I, so now I said, well, treat it as a factor. Um, and when you treat something as a factor, then it then it then it, it makes it discrete. So it's um, just zero and one instead of that continuum. Then I tried to change it so that I could just rename the column. And it did this, and I have no, I, I, I don't know why. So if anybody wants to try to debug it, I, I have I have no idea why it did this. Um, it should have worked. Um, I could probably, I'll, I'll look at it later, and I'm sure I'll figure it out. But like today, I was like, yeah, I can't get this to work. Um, okay, and, oh, okay. And so here, box plot. So I'm here, I'm looking at, um, the time to AIDS, um, and then I'm separating that out by the status of whether or not they got this, um, this uh, whether or not they got um, H, whether or not they, they, sorry, whether or not, I have, I, the SI status, I'm just gonna say that because I can't, I keep wanting to say the word and I can't pronounce it, think it, think it, something. Anyway, uh, nobody in here knows what I'm talking about? The SI status? Never heard of it? Okay. I hadn't heard of it till till I started working on this either. Hey, so wait here. It is I have the paper, this modeling paper that talks about it. Um there it is. Bodies known as Sin what? Sensitia. Thank you. Sensitia. Okay, so there's sensitia status. So this is their, their, their time to developing AIDS broken down in box plots, broken down by uh, sensitious status. Okay. 
Um, and I also wondered about, and I, so, so there, here, you can, you would look at that and you'd say, that's probably not much difference, right? This, this has got, you know, bigger variability, but, you know, it looks like the medians are about the same. Um, again, 100% exploratory here. Um, then I said, well, I know, I'm pretty sure that CCR5 is going to, is going to matter, right? Because, because if they're, if they're, um, heterozygous for that, um, that should affect the time to, to um, acquire HIV. And yes, you can see that, right? Um, and it, it makes a whole lot of sense because if you have um, one mutant copy, that's 50% you know, gonna get expressed. So um, those cells are gonna be, what, what Josh is like, are you laughing at me, Josh? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So <laughs> That's fine. Um, so, and and if, and you see the NAs in here too. So, um, so ggplot automatically figures out that you know there's another cat. It, it takes the NA as another category, a categorical variable. Um, and here, I just wanted this is I only did this because I wanted to show you scatter plots. Um, so wait, this is. Yeah, I just wanted to show you. So I, I said, well, okay, let's look at all the people who have who have progressed to age, to AIDS, and then let's see if their age of infection affects the time to to um to AIDS progression. And again, that doesn't really look like it. I don't really see much of a um, correlation there. Looks pretty random, pretty flat. Um, and here is a, so, so you can also add in here um, just one line of code and you can see the best fit line. So there's this line right in here that gives me the best fit line to the data and just plots it. Um, and also gives me a 95% confidence interval about the line. So I love to do that. <laughs> and here I just, here's how to just do a fit. So um, to get your linear fit, you just, um, you do, uh, so I'm taking out, again, I do the same thing I did before. I'm taking out the people, um, only the people who have HIV, uh, sorry, <laughs> AIDS, only the people who have progressed to AIDS. Um, and again, now I'm really, now I'm, now I'm looking, I'm actually doing the linear fit instead of just plotting it with ggplot. And I save it into something called fit AIDS. And so now this, this is a big object that, uh, that has a whole bunch of stuff in it. And so I can run the command summary and it gives me all the, the stats about it. And of course, you can see here that the, this is the coefficient for time and it's not, it, it, it's not significantly correlated. Um, and then you can also just use a plot command and it generates all these non-ggplot plots, which are, in my opinion, hideous. <laughs> but this is like, this is a base R plotting. You can see your QQ plot. Um, but these are nice for just like very quick, you know, you've done a linear fit or you've done a um, logistic re regression or something. And then you can just go say, okay, plot. And it'll give you the relevant plots that you need without you having to do anything extra. Okay, so that's my demo. Any questions about that? Good, because it was just demo. Okay. Very good. All right. So now, um, now I'd like to start doing a little bit of the introduction. And I really, I'm, I'm surprised that so many people have at least some basic R skills. Um, and I, I kind of did the thing in my notes where I'm like, okay, I'm going to go really carefully through these things. And then I'm going to skip over functions and for loops. And I'm actually wondering if maybe I should invert that idea um, and talk about functions and for loops. Okay. But first, what I want to do, though, is I'm going to talk to you about, so let's go into the notebook. Um, this is going to be 01, Introduction to R, the RMD. So click on that to open it. And then immediately go over here and do a Save As. And change the file name however you wish, but just make it something else. Okay. Um, all right, so 
when I say basic R, also I just mostly mean base R. <laughs> um, so base R, so R is a system of packages, right? Um, there's a base package that has all the very, you know, the core commands. What probably was S, like at R started as a language called S back in the 70s, I think, and then, um, and then it was modified a couple of times, and then at some point they rewrote everything. I think it was originally Fortran. They rewrote everything in C, and they called it R because the names of the, and that was after the names of the authors um, who did the big change to to the program. But anyway, so base R is really just it's like histogram, plotting a basic histogram. It's generating numbers from distribution. So um, R norm or and D norm and P norm and all those things. Um, I think LM is also base R. So it's all like just the, the, the really, really simple stuff. And then over the decades, people have been adding and adding and adding and adding. And now we have this super rich um, um, programming tool that does just many, many things. Um, but first, you really you know, want to know the basics. So we're going to go through this um, just one step at a time. Um, okay. Don't have to worry about all this text. I write these things so that you can go back and read them later on. But I'm just going to don't, don't please don't try to read everything. Um, okay. So so I want to talk about some basic programming concepts with you. I, I know you've programmed before, but you may or may not have thought about things sort of a little bit more formally. Um, it, so um, there's something called style. Does everybody know, anybody know what style means when I talk about programming? <laughs> yes, style. It's how you, it's basically just how the code looks. It's, it's how many spaces you put, you know, after a comma. It's, it's how, how, how you indent things. And it actually matters for programming. Right? You want really readable code. And readable code is not like putting everything on the same, you know, like if you have an if else, you don't do if blah blah blah, you know, across, right? You you want to space things out properly. And there are actual style guides. So especially if you work for like a large like Google has their own R style guide. Um, the um, Hadley Wickham, who is I don't know, what would you describe Hadley Wickham as? R guru? Oh, God of R. God of R, yeah, something like that. Um, minor God of R. Minor God, yeah, kind of minor, I think, because not the creator God. No, no, but he's someone who sort of oversees emperor. Of R. <laughs> Probably a good one. He might well be, yeah, yeah. But but he wrote a lot of um, the, the the sort of the core text on R. So R for packaging. Um, R for data analysis, advanced R. Um, I love advanced R because it really gets into the guts of like what R is, which is a functional programming language. And it's if you're in, if you're if you're a coding geek, I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, R for data science is also a, a nice book if you're especially if what all you want to do is like analyze your data and you're not really terribly interested in the structure of the language itself. Um, so style style matters, and we're not going to cover a lot, anything about style in here. But I have given you, um, if you in the knitted documents, um, there's a link to the um, tidyverse guide, and I don't know if I had the Google one in there too. Well, you can look, at, you can find Google's style guide if you want to. But what you'll find is they're different, right? Like Google says, you know, some things allowed, and other. I think so. Some places will use equal signs for assignment. And that you are expected to use equal signs. Hadley Wickham, though, she's using arrow. <laughs> and the arrow operator, back arrow. Um, I actually prefer in R, especially now with tidyverse and the pipes, to use, to use the arrow because you have the reverse arrow, which is the forward arrow. So you can follow a pipe of code down. You'll see what, if you don't know what I mean now, you'll see later. Follow a pipe of code down and then keep going, like in the same direction. Um, so I, I like that, but um, but again, that's a style. But the main thing about style is consistency, right? You want read well, readability for, for your code and and consistency. So you should try to oh. 
<laughs> That's one of Josh's kids. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Never mind then. This spam. <laughs> oh, dad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you need you want to be consistent. Uh, Right, so here, like, this is all, like, equivalent, like, ways of assigning variables, and uh, you can see that you can use the back arrow, you can use the right arrow, and you can use the equal sign, okay? Um, for, I prefer, like I said, I prefer the, um, the, the um, arrows. Does anybody know why I use arrows in R? Yeah, I read about it, but I don't remember. <laughs> yes, Josh? Josh? Is this a PDP 11, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, the old the machines that they developed on, there was actually an arrow key um, on the keyboard. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a pain, though, because we don't have that, and now you just have to do, like, you know, less than dash, less than dash. No, there's no... There is a keyboard shortcut, right? Yeah. yeah. There's probably one for the pipe, too, but I just type. <laughs> I think the next thing the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to start writing little code snippets in chat GBT and not worry about it but <laughs> okay so in here so my, in my notes the first thing I have is variable assignment but since everybody seems to have had some experience with R I don't think that this is a point I need to believe so you all know what variables are if anybody doesn't speak up if anybody doesn't know what variables are or does not know what I mean by assignment, ask me. Okay. So there are examples in here, and you can look at them yourselves, but like I said, since everybody has some experience, I don't want to go into it. But I do want to talk a little bit about data types, because if you have some experience with R, you might not really think about these a lot. But they can be important, especially when you're doing things like what I just did with ggplot. And I had a variable that was numeric, and R saw it as a numeric, but it automatically assumes that that's going to be um, on a continuous scale. And so you need to know what's the difference between numeric and factor. Okay. Um, and also, like, you can have integers and, and doubles, too. So, okay. So the first type is numeric. This includes uh, both floating points, which are decimals, and integers. Um, if you've done any other kind of programming, especially with, um, like, say, something like C or C++, um, you have to be very careful about whether you're going to call something an integer versus calling it um, uh, a numeric, right? Because if you want to use something, say, as, a, as an index to an array, it better be an integer. It better not be um, a floating point because C doesn't know what to do with that. Um, so there's numeric, as you have numeric, we do have integer. Um, I believe still, um, even with like the new tidyverse stuff, um, when something parses as numeric, like you read in a file and it says, and it figures out that it's numeric, it, it generally won't assign integer, I don't think. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, Josh or Richard. If you read in a CSV file and you've got uh, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain. You can't, it, it will not parse. None of the readers were, were going to parse a, something as integer. Uh, for part, or for, I think any of them. Are, you, can, you can tell it. I don't think the parsers, but I don't think, but I don't think the parsers actually say, oh, I only see integers here. This is an integer. I mean, you have to tell it somehow that you want to. Okay. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. But anyway. Um, and then, so you can have an integer. Then you can have a variable that's illogical. And they can only take values true or false. And these are, these are really important, too, because I'm pretty sure that R deals with things differently if you have it logical versus um, 0, 1, for example. Um, and then there's characters. So character is going to be just essentially strings, um, words and letters. And it's very important to know that numbers can be true. Oops, 
I hate when I do that. Num <laughs> Numbers can be <laughs> treated as characters too. So if you put like a two in quotes, then it's a, then it's a, it's a character. It's not a number. And that will, you know, result in some issues later. Um, and so I think one of the big things you run into is if you have, if you have something that's supposed to be numeric, but it actually comes in as character, and then you maybe try to sort it or something, you get weird sorts, right? Because you'll get one, 10, 11, right? Um, so you want to be aware of that. All right. Um, and then there's factors. So again, a variable that can only take on a finite number of that values, right? So male, female, um, eye color, uh, could be brown, blue, hazel, or green. Um, so those are, um, yeah, so those are your categorical var variables. And many times you really do want to make sure that they're not, and, and the new readers actually, so an introduction, something they introduced in Tigers was it by default, something that's a string is going to be read in as, as a character. Because the old readers would assign it as a factor most of the time. Um, so like read.csv would, would read in um, a, you know, something that's a character and assign it immediately as a factor. Um, so now it actually goes in. Now it's now, it's, now most of the readers will read it as character, and then you have to specify that you want to see it as a factor. Okay. Okay. And so all of these things that I've just mentioned, these are what I call the atomic type. So what it means is those, are, so atoms are things that you make other things out of by combining them. And that's what these are. So you can you take these atomic types, like numeric or factor or logical, um, and make them into, say, vectors, which would be one-dimensional lists. So definitions here, a vector is a one-dimensional array with elements of one atomic type. So a vector is either all characters, all numbers, all integers, all logical. You can't mix the types and have it still be a vector. Okay. Um, a list is like a vector, but the elements can be anything. So like in a vector, I have like the first element is, is a character, second ele element is another character, third, whatever, or string or whatever. Um, but in a list, I can have, you know, a string, I can have numbers, I can have the whole data frame as an element of the list. So basically, the list is the most general object you can have in R. Um, because it basically means you can put you can put lists in lists, right? anything. A data frame, and this is, I don't know, at some point I'm going to stop talking about data frames and only have tibbles, or at some point they're going to throw out all of the data frame in R, the old data frame, and we're just going to call them the tibbles data frames. But um, what happened was, this, um, let's just tell you what a data frame is first. The data frame is a two-dimensional array that allows the columns to be different types, but they have to be the same length. So this is just your Excel spreadsheet, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's got, well, I don't know, because you can do weird things in Excel, but, um, but the, the main thing about the data frame is that all the columns have to be the same length. And if you, if you read in something that's, okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna say something dumb, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, there's work that I've done where I've gotten like, I have different, lengths of columns and they just read them in as, as NA, but that's, that's unusual. Um, so um, that's a data frame. That table is just a data, another data frame, um, but it's got different aspects. So, yes? Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, like, so I don't know how many years ago now, it is now seven years ago or so. Um, our people got together and they were like, these are the things we hate about data frames. <laughs> Let's change them. And, and they did. And so, and, but they, they couldn't get, they couldn't just call it data frame because they have all this old code that would break if you called it the same thing. So they came up with this name called Tibble. So Tibble really is just, it's the same thing. It's, you've got like 
all your co you have columns can be any type, but within within a column, it's one type, and then they have to be the same, um, the same length, all of them. That's it. But then you know it's like so when you have like when you print out a, a data frame and has it has some default print program or function that prints it in a certain way. Tibbles have a different print function that actually makes it that actually comes out a lot nicer. So. Yeah. That's the only difference. Like R. No. Okay. No. So it's so it's um. So it, how how it gets read in the, the reader functions that read that return symbols. They do the thing when I like I said they they they, they take a character vector and they just make a character. They multiply default make it into a factor unless you tell it to. Um. What else is there? Um. Other like for example, um, all of the tidy like tidy R and um, and the flyer packages, all of the like the tidy merge packages, they accept and return tuples. So if you try to put a data frame into um, it's past the phone though, it won't like it. You have to you have to convert it to a tuple first. Um, and it, it, it contains actually sort of metadata too. Right. So, uh, it won't print. Yeah, that's right. Well, the big question was what, whether or not it was just like how you view, how you see it, but it's, but there's other internal things that are different about it as well. Yeah, but yeah, the print function is much nicer. Yeah. There's some, there's some things that I can't remember if Not, not updating their code, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. If that's something that's uh, that when you run it, it'll give you a warning that'll specify. Sometimes the warnings are pretty specific, or is it something that if you, if you Google it real quick, you'll find like I can't remember. Yeah. 
yeah, I'd actually leave the spaces in and put it in and put it in, in quotes for you. Yeah, then so the naming's a little bit different too. Yeah, yeah, because actually you saw probably in my demo. I don't know if you really noticed, but the all the 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 column names have dots in them. So it was like si dot stat, um, and that's that's not good. R um, that is no longer considered. Um, um, Good style, I guess, and R, um, because dots are, I mean, people who come from other programming languages, especially ones that are like Python, where you have object-oriented things, the, the periods mean something. And in R, you know, people were just using them as a, you know, like, like you'd use an underscore or something to separate what, 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 and he's shaking his head no. Oh, about R, people using dots. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you shouldn't, shouldn't. Yeah, don't even get me started on object-oriented stuff or object-oriented in R. I'll, I'll go on a rant, and it will be longer than longer than Josh's. Okay, so there, there's the. Um, I just want to see something that character. Oh, they took friend and group as character. Okay, weird. Okay, um, and then and then there's exercises that you really don't need to worry about um, unless you want to do them. Um, operators, which I'm not going to go over because if you've used R, you probably know that there's, you know, subtraction and and multiplication and addition and division. Um, again, feel free to ask me if you have any questions, but I'm just skipping it because because I think it's something that we don't really need to take. Um, you might want to do these exercises. Um, it might be a little, I don't know, if you get a little bit of insight into how the exponential works. Um, okay, and these are more exercises. Ah, and the next topic is loops and branching, um, which I was going to skip, um, but I might. Um, who wants to hear about four loops next week? I'm seeing shaking heads. I'm seeing that. Nah, nah, nah. Okay, cool. All right, so then I'm going to do four loops next week. Um, and we'll also. Yeah, and then and then and then that's a natural step to vectorization, which is kind of why I like to do it. Um, I was just gonna throw it out because it's also kind of complicated for people who don't have experience. With that too. So now we have to do the thing. Uh, okay. We want everybody to do the survey, and I need to. I need to let everybody read my email now. Uh -oh. um, Quit. Oh yeah, sorry. Ah, sorry, it's fine. Oh. <laughs> there's nothing in here. That's... For the people on Zoom, there's a sign up link sheet that Kelly sent out. If you can fill that out, if you haven't already. Oh wait, that's no, not that. I want to click on the other thing. Stop. Go back. Stop. Okay. okay, there we go. This is the one. Okay, so here's the QR code that will go to a survey that we'd like you to ask. It's part of the NIH. Part of this, like we, we have an educational um, consultant who works with us. Yeah, 